So here's the thought that I want to bring to you is you may not be called into ministry and you may just be growing as a Christian, but at the same time you want to know, and you may have these questions of, am I qualified? I've made mistakes in my life. What would allow me to do ministry or even just be a leader? Things that I wish I might have known. What are some tips and the materials that could help me to grow to be a leader? As not everyone is called to be a pastor or a minister, but you can still be a leader and a mentor to friends, family, your children. There's others that you can be a leader to. So I have this distinction that I'm going to present to you today, and I have four questions that I asked a dear friend and pastor to answer for me on episode 16 of The 318 Project. This is The 318 Project, a guide to equip men through godly principles and develop as husbands, fathers, and sons. And now, your host, Ryan Hare. Hello, and thanks for joining me on this episode of The 318 Project. This episode is going to be a little bit different because it's not a straightforward interview. A dear friend of mine who was a pastor, he responded. So I have his responses to these four key questions that you need to know on being a leader and just helping you grow as a Christian. So I reached out and Desmond Frey responded. So Desmond pastored a church in Zurich, Switzerland, called Powerhouse Church, and he was a pastor there for several years. Another church in the area called Chrysalis Zentrum Bucheg, which is translated in English, Christ Center Church, they were going through some transition. And again, where Desmond, he does a lot of coaching and leadership training, the staff there had asked him to come in and kind of do some training with them. And during that time, they were going through some transitions themselves with Powerhouse Church. And just the Lord led them to eventually merge with this church. And during that time, he was headed up their international services. So now he is the lead pastor for the international services of this church. So with this, he is also part of the staff, and he also oversees four other churches. During this time, he also teaches and speaks to pastors and students and and universities and ministerial schools throughout Europe, Eurasia, and several of the foreign Soviet countries. They're also part with their missions in their church that includes fighting against human trafficking, and and especially in the country of Moldova. So besides these ministries, him and his wife, Sandy, they have been married for 34 years now. They have two sons and two daughters and nine grandkids. But him and his wife, Sandy, they host around two to four refresh marriage seminars a year around the world. So he has this vast knowledge and training and teaching leaders and -and up-and-coming ministers. So I've asked these four questions, and I'm going to go through and present these four questions for you to hear, uh, and then we're going to hear his responses. And then after that, I'm going to kind of expound on some of his answers of what I feel Uh, Even for me, what are some things that would go with those questions and his responses as well? So the first question is, what is the one thing you wish you knew before you had started in ministry or mentoring men? For me, very obviously, one would be learning to say no. Um, I learned the hard way, just giving, giving, giving on all different fronts, you know, um, ministry. Um, and whenever you give, it's always at the expense of something. Um, in, in fact, you, you cheapen the value of, let's say, ministry if you're not investing in your family at the same time. Um, in other words, I don't want to be a great minister at the expense of being a bad husband, bad father. You know, I don't want Bible school students to be excellent pastors at the expense, 
you know, of being bad Christians. Um, so that, that's kind of what I'm saying with that. I, I was way off balance with that in the beginning because my zeal and my hunger uh, to accomplish something, which most young men in their 20s and 30s, they got to drive to prove to themselves that they can do something. So it's, a, it's an internal engine that just drives them to, to really prove to themselves that they can build something, accomplish something, um, reach a certain goal, um, money, fame or social standing or accolades in the church or a certain position, you know, pastor or whatever else. And so when, when they go ahead and they, they engage in that and they just keep on giving, um, and when it comes to mentoring men and discipling men, um, it is so easy to pour into lives that are hungry, but eventually you oversaturate um, the sowing and the and the the giving into a life where they cannot even absorb all that you give. They will tell you to your face, "Wow, and thank you, and great, and this is amazing, and so wonderful, and you know, and I'm growing and changing." But they can probably retain, I don't know, twenty percent of what you've given them. So it's almost like a baby when you feed a baby, you you can just feed and feed and feed, and eventually it'll burp burp it out, and. Um, because its its appetite is saturated, it's going to get, you know, help it to digest, <clears throat> help them to do it, live it, think about it, meditate on it, and then when they're hungry, to come back and eat some more. So I think that's something that I would definitely um, caution any young uh, person starting out in ministry, mentoring men. Uh, learn to say no, learn to find your rhythm, learn to find your balance, learn to find that you minister and give to people out of the overflow of what you're receiving and that you have people around you that know your gifting, know your limitations. Um, so, yeah, I think that's going to be probably one of the most um, important things at the beginning. Learn to say no, because I know I had to learn it the hard way. I only realized this later on in ministry, because when you've gained some experience and you've gone for it, you know, a couple of decades or three, you, you're beginning to see um, the fruit that remains and you're beginning to see um, that not those that were always the hungriest and the ones that are just knocking your door down um, are the ones that then basically go out and do something great and mighty with what you've given them. Um, so you begin to discern also who is really um, a vessel that's kind of worthy of you pouring into because you really don't want to pour, uh, throw your, you know, your pearls before swine. You you don't want to just go out there and be an open faucet. It's kind of like, you know, the hose pipe, the garden hose. Um, if you just turn it on, it'll kind of just, you know, and just kind of splash all over and kind of fly around like a snake. But if you hold the end, the nozzle, and direct it, you know, to a plant or a flower, you can turn it up, water it, close it again. You can turn it on, close it. You can be a lot more strategic in how you do that. And people that say no, one, one person once said this. In fact, Zig Ziglar said to me once, um, one of the biggest difference that he thinks between successful people and unsuccessful people is that successful people know when to say no. And, um, and he, in fact, he added on saying he probably says more no than yes. And he really feels that he's an empower, a, a yes person. But he will say no to something that is not um, uh, convenient, timely, um, in his calling, in his flow, in his rhythm. And, um, and that's something you usually learn the hard way. So I would give that to a young person. Starting out in ministry is one of the most important things. I have to agree with Desmond on that, that sometimes we do have to learn to say no. So many times we feel as leaders, and not just in, in church, but even at work, around your family, sometimes you want to be that person that everybody loves and wants to be around. And, and so it's, sometimes it, it is hard to say no, because then you feel like you're you're hated or, or people won't like you and, and don't want to be with you. But sometimes 
you can only do so much, not just as a minister, as I've said, but you may be just being that dad or husband. And sometimes there's just so much that you can do. And it's going to take those times of saying, no, I can't do this role. I can't carry this load. And even for a minister that's trying to grow a church or grow a fellowship, sometimes you're going to have to say no because your family does take that priority, as Desmond was saying. And the other part is if if you're looking for that person that's going to mentor you, or even if you're looking to disciple and mentor somebody, that part of oversaturating, because again, there's only so much that you can take in at a time. And so it's not a short-term answer. So you can't feel like you have to just give everything into them in a short amount of time. It's going to take that time of nurturing and growing and allow them to grow through that. Now, the second question that I presented to Desmond is, what is the biggest mistake you have made, whether it's as a mentor, a husband, a father, a leader, or even a Christian? The answer for me for that would be... Um, to, yeah, probably to realize the, the, the patterns in my life. And, um, when my dad, um, growing up, I was the middle one. My older brother was a a genius in school. He could never do anything less than an A. And then my younger brother, um, he was a baby, so he could never do anything wrong. <clears throat> and, uh, so my older and my younger brother were always getting, um, affirmation from my dad and, um, and I didn't. So I was kind of stuck in between and the, the middle one would always adapt. Well, what it developed in my life as a, as a negative pattern is that I aimed to please people so I can get their affirmation. So I would manipulate myself. I would basically self-sabotage myself um, and work extra hard, uh, neglect the family to have the senior pastor praise me and congratulate me and all those things. And it, it took a while, I think for almost too long. I was probably in my mid-30s when I really began to discover the the devastation and the manipulation that this pat- pattern had in my life and how it, it affected every area of my life. And it's almost like the alcoholic. You cannot go back and have just one drink because you'll fly right back into the old pattern. And I think in my life, I realized that if if I feed on uh, compliments, if I feed on you know, people praising me and all that. If, if, if the moment, and I, I can tell, I can feel it in me, in my body when a, a, a compliment comes or, or something that I, I, I need to right then saying, look, this is just somebody being kind to me. It's not something I need in my life. It is not something that I need to sustain. It is not something I need to create an appetite for. Uh, and I've learned to having to, um, to not pick it up, but just lay it there because it definitely can be a bait. So I think that's something that has cost me so many hours and so many days and weeks and months probably of, um, of just dealing with stuff, um, emotional management, um, feeling not worthy, second guessing myself, um, all these different things that, um, that I saw out of this pattern, how it really messed things up. And um, so, yeah, that that was probably the biggest mistake I can say is that I, I, and maybe a little bit, you know, to my own defense, I, I didn't know that the that there were patterns until somebody taught me and somebody actually exposed things in me and 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 I learned some things, you know, the hard way and and began to realize and then I began to study about it and uh, and. It's it's amazing how today I can very easily see and discover in other 
people, especially young ministers, I can see patterns in their lives and different things much, much easier than when I was their age. So I think that was probably going to be the biggest thing that I would say was um, was my mistake because it kind of affected really every area of my life. And it weakened, you know, every area where it, it just, but I mean, you know, God makes up the difference. And I think that he restores the years that you've wasted and all those things. But it cost me dearly. I mean, my burnout alone cost me 20 years of, uh, excuse me, 10 years of full-time ministry. So I stepped out of full-time ministry. I went into part-time ministry for 10 years when the secular world um, left um, the church world. And I mean, weekends and evenings, I was involved in the church, you know, uh, a whole bunch, but I wasn't full-time in the ministry. Um, so there was a price to pay for for the mistakes that I've made with that. And um, anyway, good to learn. So that's really the biggest thing that I would say, yeah, would be a mistake in my life. Man, that was a great answer and a great response, Desmond. You know, so that that's, that really resonates even with me because those patterns in our life, we don't sometimes recognize them. It's kind of like the seasons of, of changing. You know, we go through those seasons in our lives as well, the high points and the low points. But seeing those patterns and being able to recognize them and how they affect us, you know, that, that negative pattern of wanting to please people and, and feeling like you have to get that self self gratification of the accolades and the pat on the back. And at the same time, like you said, if you get so caught up and consumed in that, we can neglect our families and just get and it's and it's almost becomes that flesh. That flesh wants to rise up as you said, that bait of just feeding the flesh. Now, question number three is this what is the one tip that you can give to other men? To help them, whether they are mentoring or discipling another man, or that they may be looking for someone to mentor and disciple them. I would definitely say that it is, um, I'm just thinking there's probably two or three things, but I think if there would be one thing I would select is to be very careful who I invest into. I would be very selective who that I would um, would pour my life into. Um, just being hungry, just being keen and uh, uh, is, is not, <clears throat> you know, a good, or a, I can say the, the strongest indication that that person will be successful. Um, I really got to see why they would need this. You know, is there really a calling upon their life? Uh, do they have a lot of personal issues and problems in their lives that they feel the teaching of this men's curriculum and all the revelation that comes from that, is that to basically help them heal um, and, and help them just to get well and to sort out their mess? Or is it to really going to build them? I think the people that are most successful with what I've given them are people that kind of have, you know, two tracks, you know, on the train line. And the one is they do realize that they need to change and they do realize they need to grow and, and, um, and make some major decisions to really, you know, move from um, dysfunction to being functional. And then the other one, of course, the track is that they will go ahead and they want to, uh, support and feed and nurture a, a calling that is upon their lives. And I think there's a healthy balance in between that. I think people that can realize the balance in that are people that are going to be very successful. But there's those that, you know, don't really want to nurture or call. They just want to sort out their mess. They want to, you know, deal with the habits in their lives and the hurts and the dysfunctional upbringing and all that stuff. And, and those people are more like patients. And the moment they feel that they're going to be a little bit healthy, they will leave the hospital. They will leave the program. Um, if they feel like, okay, I'm better now, you know, you've poured your life into them. They say, thanks, see ya. Um, 
those are the people that sometimes would would it would really irritate me because um I, you know i pour my life into them i help them get their marriage back together i help them find a job and get their life straight and the moment things are flying formation you know they just seem to be turning around saying thanks you know going to a different church or whatever and i've always had the big puzzle the big question why and i'm beginning to realize they came in sick and now that they well they don't need a physician they don't even need a doctor they can just go and of course the other hand is those people that have a calling upon their lives that do realize that they that god's hands upon them that there's a mandate that they need to fulfill and um and and that keeps you kind of humble that keeps a good balance because you'll never really arrive in saying i am now fully qualified i'm fully um you know um doing what god's called me to do there's always a a a growth process with that there's a maturing with that and people that i've seen that know the difference between those two they they still have issues in their lives which means they stay humble enough to be teachable and correctable um and on the other hand they are very ambitious and they want to do something for god and really give you know all of their lives out there um I think that's the one aspect another one also is do I have the time to really invest in them I think that's a big deal um towards the I mean when when your dad came over and and you know Joaquin and all the guys and we had these great mentoring years of 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 men's ministry and um up in the mountains these gatherings I mean it was really fun um as long as i can really devote myself to it but then you know john maxwell um i was doing stuff for him all over europe and we mentored leaders and all that stuff and it was just very exciting but i could tell the moment i began to delegate certain things in the men's ministry and focus you know some of my 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 key time basically uh to something else um then it just began to slip and it didn't go so i need to make sure to begin with you know do i really have the time to invest into it is it really um you know as a pastor that important the main thing um or is there also other things you know i mean as a pastor myself now um it's not just men's ministry i mean we have 230 small groups there's eight pastors you know on the team uh kids ministry worship teams four campuses five services on a sunday i mean these are all these different things so i cannot just devote myself completely to men's thing as much as i'm passionate about it you know i got to make sure that it fills into the into the structure with that bet that i find somebody that really is devoted to it with the calling and saying this is why i'm on the earth um and that's going to be usually the most successful people that that do that but i think going back to it do i have the time to invest make sure I invest in the people that are ready for this that really want this um meaning that there's two tracks you know one is they are dealing with some issues in their lives and of course the other track is that they know there's a calling upon their lives and then they're going to be hungry to be developing that gift and calling again such a great answer and response from Desmond you have to be very careful and selective of whoever you are going to mentor or who you are looking f- to mentor you because you want to make sure that that person whether you're mentoring that you can be able to pour into them and they're going to commit or if you're looking for that person that is going to mentor you that they are going to invest that time and and be as we've talked before being transparent and vulnerable Uh, And even for you to be able to be transparent and vulnerable to those that you are mentoring to. And and that's what's been so special for me is that those that have been those mentors in my life, they have taken that time to invest in me. And and even for me on, on my part to appreciate that, but also take that time to allow them to pour into me, even if it's a time of correction, because we need that healthy balance, as Desmond was saying, of the healing and growing of a calling. And you may be saying, well, I don't have a calling, but even if it's just to be able to be a better husband, a better father, to have a stronger marriage, just growing as a Christian, 
that's where you get that that healing and that health and that growth at. And it's part of that growth and maturing process. And even like Desmond says, we're, even for those that are established Christians, we're still learning. You're still growing. And sometimes it it still brings you to those points of being humble. Uh, and like he said, finding the time to invest. That's the biggest key as with that of finding that time, whether it's even just a once a week. And that's what I have a you know, dear friend of mine. And we've already had on a previous a podcast episode, Lee Grady. He finds that time once a week to send a text of just some of his discipleship tips and notes, and even sometimes checking to see how you're doing. And that is key to being a mentor is is finding that time to invest in growing with them and in them and investing in those that are, are ready and hungry to develop. Finally, the fourth question that I presented to Desmond was this. Besides the Bible, what is your favorite tool or study material, books, techniques that you like and would refer and recommend to help train, mentor, instruct, strengthen, encourage, or even disciple men? Obviously, I think hands down, um, the curriculum majoring in men is is still my my most favorite when it comes to mentoring guys. I think also very good is um, John Maxwell's Equip course. Um, there is six booklets at six lessons each, so thirty six lessons in volume one, thirty six lessons in volume two, and also in volume three. Um, those are key, which is basically um, taking all of these books that John Maxwell wrote and it puts it into kind of bite-sized lessons. Um, that's another great thing. Um, I think also what I've really learned um, for whom I learned from is Casey Treat, um, Renewing the Mind, his teachings on that, his teachings on um, your vision is your future. Um, that's been very, very helpful. Um, I devoured the, some of the, his, his early, uh, cassette tapes, you know, those series like 12 cassette tapes and 10 cassette tapes and all that. But any material by, by Casey Treat. He has online teachings now at Christian Faith, uh, up in Seattle. Um, so you can even go look at some of his sermons and, and, and listen to those if you'd like to. Um, Frank Damasio's book, The Making of a Leader, old classic. Um, I don't know in which print it is now, but it's probably been printing the tens of thousands of copies of, of that. It's just an amazing book on leadership. It's very theological. It's very thorough. A lot of scripture support and all that, yet very easy to actually page through and to see topic by topic. Um, what I've learned most out of that probably is just the process of the call, the process of discipleship, the process of um, um, moving, you know, people basically down uh, the timeline of their, their, their development process. Um, that was really very, very helpful. Um, I love actually Dr. Caroline Leaf. Uh, the the neurosurgeon turn ministry and and the reason why is just because of some of the some of the neuroscience behind um, habits and what the brain does and 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 how to deal with crisis and how the brain functions um, and the endorphins and just getting some of the practical views of neuroscience helped me to really Look at men struggling with habits, struggling with identity, struggling with diff different things. It helped me really appreciate that um, it's not always just a sin question, that there's been conditionings beforehand, there's been different things happening. Why do some guys seem to snap out of, you know, lulls and, 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 and depressions and bad habits much faster than others? Well, I think it's got also something to do in how the mind was shaped and formed um, in the younger years. And um, and I think it's it's a bit naive to say, 
Uh, I'm not trying to discredit God's word and the power of the anointing and all that, but I think there is a factor to 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 learn um, when it comes to really the way God made us and made our brain. You know that every impact has a reaction. Um, that anybody who's who's loud and going out and um, in in a sense of um, um, anger or um, uncontrollable lusts or or just different things that is just the fruit and, and we don't deal with fruit we look at the root so every action has a reaction and oftentimes the reaction is the public but the action is the is the secret and so it helped me just to understand so all of Caroline Leaf's material is great, but there's a few ones that I really enjoy when it comes to, um, like I said, habits and dealing with toxic thoughts and all those things. It, I just love that kind of a stuff, and it really spoke to me. Um, yeah, and I think um, just the experience in life that I've had, um, I know you asked about materials, but I think it's very important to become a student also of what you've learned and a student of your life and your ups and downs and your failures and successes and those things. Um, and that, of course, you know, is is great. I think guys like um, Jim, Ron, uh, Zig Ziglar, um those were guys that uh, motivational speakers, uh, Tony Robbins, um, those are coaches that are just, you know, I guess the Cadillacs or the, the Lambo, you know, of, of the, of the great cars out there, the great uh, people out there. Ed Milet is another one um, who are, you know, for most of the strong Christians and they really have a, have a faith based belief and yet they do a lot of good um coaching um out of that so yeah i think those were some of the things that really helped me uh fill my toolbox and and i'm keep on adding it you know um i know that craig rochelle is helping me a great deal um my pastor chris hodges from church of the highlands in alabama um he has mentored me greatly um Greg Surratt, the president of the ARC. Um, I mean, there's just a number of guys out there that have been just really solid in, in, in coaching and giving me some advice and some things. Thank you, Desmond, for that response. Those are great suggestions for men to check out, whether it's John Maxwell, Casey Treat, Frank Damasio, or even Dr. Caroline Leaf, and even... As I've been teaching myself, the Majoring in Men curriculum books by Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole. Those are the ones that I would highly recommend myself, first and foremost, because I know the impact that it's had on my life, on my marriage, and just inspiring me to grow to be a better, as the motto is, a better husband, a better father, and a better son, and just trying to be a better Christian. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and put links uh, to those websites for for the ones that Desmond had mentioned, John Maxwell, Casey Treat, Frank Damasio, and Dr. Caroline Leaf. And I'm also going to provide affiliation links to those from Amazon if you want to check them out to be able to purchase some of those books that were mentioned in this. But I want to thank you for joining me today on this episode of The 318 Project. And like I said, I know it's a little different, and Desmond is that that leader. He's a teacher. He's training uh, pastors and leaders. And so just to have him respond to these questions, hopefully it will help you as you grow to look beyond of, I'm not qualified, or I've gone through these mistakes. I've had these own mistakes in my life. How can I be a leader? What do I look for as a leader? And what can I do to be a better leader through studying and just growing? And I want to thank you for joining me, as I've said. I want to thank you for joining me on the 318 Project. And if you can, just remember to like, subscribe, and of course share with other men this podcast. And like I've said before, and I still want to emphasize this, if you have any thoughts, comments, or suggestions you can reach me at speakpipe.com forward slash the 318 project. 
and it's just a small recording. You can hit it, record, it'll give a small uh, audio recording that will come to my email directly, and then I can respond back to you if if need be. But again, I just want to thank you for joining me, and as we go on this journey of growing to be better men, and remember to have a blessed and wonderful day. Thank you for joining on this adventure of integrity and honor in godly masculinity. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast with other men. And remember to keep building faithful men.